uh, by saying two things. The first is I think I should tell you a little about myself to justify my being here. And, uh, and the second is to say that I know I'm probably going to be pitching this at a level that is too low for many of you, because I think many of you um, are very experienced. Indeed, some of you I know from um, days past uh, are quite experienced in being expert witnesses, but I had to approach this on the basis that uh, what is needed is how to get someone to be an expert witness rather than simply going over what might happen in court. And so I've approached it on that basis. The personal explanation, uh, I was the first lawyer in my family. I come from a family that is, consists and still does largely of physicists, engineers, and oddly enough, doctors. I have uh, a son who's in radiology. I have two nephews who are in emergency medicine and one who's a neurosurgeon. So I'm not a stranger to the issues that doctors face when they're required to go into court. Having said that, one of one of the things that came to my attention early in my career, initially dealing with psychiatric medicine, was the dif most difficult position that doctors face when asked to give expert evidence because doctors and lawyers have an utterly different universe of discourse. And in order to put that into perspective, I've divided this paper into three basic propositions. Lawyers love alliteration. So I've called it position, preparation, and performance. Position is the first, and that results and turns around the universe of discourse. Doctors effectively, on the presentation of a patient, will conduct an examination and take a history, and then their universe of discourse commences. It's diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis for the most part. So etiology is for doctors only of interest, generally speaking, if it relates to either differential diagnosis or to treatment. Lawyers have an utterly different view of life and the world. They are only interested in somebody's medical condition either in a civil case to determine whether it has been caused in a circumstance where it will give rise to a cause of action or one that's defendable, or generally speaking, in a criminal case, whether the diagnosis has any impact on the cognitive function or responsibility of their client. And that means what lawyers call mens rea or whether or not there's a guilty mind or there is some way of medically excusing the behavior of the person involved. So we start from disparate and very difficult positions to reconcile. That often leads to very serious issues in obtaining a commonality of ground that enables us to obtain a report. So that's the position that you need to understand when you are first asked to be engaged to write a report, which is the first step to giving evidence. The second is you need to know the answer to two interrelated questions. Who is asking and who is being asked? And there's a third question that arises out of that, which is why? So the first question, that you need to ask when you're approached is who is asking? Are you being approached by a plaintiff who is seeking to recover damages? Are you being approached by a defendant? Are you being approached by perhaps the medical board or the medical tribunal to determine whether or not a doctor's uh, failed to discharge his or her uh, obligations as a medical practitioner? Are you being asked for some other collateral reason where the medicine uh, relates to the conduct of a hospital rather than an individual and so that there's a systemic or um, cultural element that involves and doesn't involve the intersection of multiple disciplines? It is important to know 
who is asking in the first instance, because you need to know when that person asks whether or not you're going to be in a position to offer assistance. The second is who is being asked, and that relates to your particular specialty. Uh, I was minded um, to give you an example of that, but I think it's probably an apposite. But um, it's, no, it's no good going to someone who's an upper GIT surgeon to get expert evidence about a shoulder reconstruction. It's, you need always to be, and there are far more subtle differentiations than that, of course, and you need to be acutely aware who, what you're being asked to do. Are you being asked to be an expert in your own field? Are you being asked to comment on something that is peculiarly within your own understanding? Or are you being asked to do something that's perhaps a little bit out of that field? And then the last question, as I said to you, is why are you being asked? What's the underlying question that you are going to be asked to agitate? These are all important because at the end of the day, the most important part of giving expert evidence is that you, one, appear expert, two, you retain your reputation as an expert and three you don't fall into the trap of going out of the area of your expertise and that then gives rise to what i think in terms of your position before we get to the preparation of writing a report is the most important thing of all the why question that i just articulated for you needs to be answered in this way what are the right questions now, that's a thing where I'm probably going to be a bit repetitive, but lawyers, regrettably, often think they know. And so they will often come to you with a proposition which may or may not have merit, but the important thing is to provide you with an accurate, factual basis for the expression of your opinion so that the right questions can be asked. And this is the first point at which I want really to drive the point home. You ought not to be, if you're going to be an expert, and I'm not going to talk to you about the standard form, you know, you've got to fill in and say, I'm an independent expert and I'm giving my opinion honestly and truthfully and all that nonsense that comes out of the Supreme Court practice. That's a given. I'm not suggesting for a moment that anyone does other than that. But in order to provide the right answer and the right assistance to the court or the right assistance to the tribunal, you have to be asked the right questions. If lawyers come to you and they've formulated questions, they are not always, indeed, I would go so far as to say, they are not often the right questions. One of the problems that flows from that is people write reports then they're asked to write supplementary reports. Then they're asked to reconsider the report and you end up with three disparate opinions which have to be reconciled. In some jurisdictions, in Queensland, for example, every report, including drafts, and I'll come to that separately, has to be served once it's been written. So you can't conceal reports. That can be problematic. So the way, the sensible way of approaching this, and it is in your hands as the expert, not in the lawyer's hands as the supplicant, if you like, is to, find, to make sure that the right questions are asked. And, in, and the way to do that is to field the approach by a telephone call. My proposition to you is don't ever report before you confer. Having a conference whether it's a telephone conference or whether you get the lawyer um, counsel, uh, if the case will justify it, to come to your rooms and not you go to them, an unusual thing you might think, but I think it's a very good one, get them to come to your space to talk about the issues and then together formulate the right questions to be asked so that the right opinion can be given is a fundamental 
and very, very rarely done exercise. Uh, it can change the complexion, not only of the case for the lawyer, but it can change the complexion of your evidence giving in court for you and make it much, much simpler. So don't report before you confer. Make sure that the right questions are, are asked and don't run the risk, to use an extraordinarily bad pun of which I'm ashamed before I say it, of being caught in a draft. Because once the report's produced, very commonly, the other side will sub subpoena any drafts that have been written. And if there are differences, you can expect cross-examination along the lines of, so doctor, when you first looked at this, you took this view. Now you've uh, changed your mind. On what basis did you do that? And you've got to explain yourself. Why put yourself in that position? When by a couple of conferences, a telephone call, a discussion, you can end up with being asked the right questions, give one opinion with which you are comfortable, and move on from there. So it's a fundamental start. And bear in mind, there are two other things to be said about lawyers. They like to interfere. They will try to tell you what to write in your report if you give them the opportunity. They will redraft it for you. They will send it back. They will say, what about this? Write your own report. Finally, in terms of that first position, remember that you are there as an expert, not an advocate. If you take the view that something wrong has been done, then the way to deal with it is to say, either in evidence when you're giving evidence orally or in the writing, is to say, this was done, A, B, and C, proper or preferable practice, in my opinion and my experience, based on whatever the material is, is one, two, and three. And for that reason, I am of the view that this consequence flows. That's important for this reason. You then appear to be what you are, an expert in a field. Once you become emotionally involved with the consequence to the to the patient, however much empathy you may feel for the patient. But once you become involved in that consequence, emotionally or apparently emotionally, that expertise goes out the window. You become an advocate for the client and the value of your evidence is significantly diminished. Let me then move on to the next of those alliterative headings, preparation. I have the greatest respect for the medical profession. As I said to you, a lot of my family are in it. We are not, however, gentlemen, ladies, the best writers of English. That is a task that other people enjoy. And when you are writing a report, one of the things that is absolutely fundamental is that that report should have two things. It should have structure and it should have flow. If you like, Think about it as if you were doing a journal paper. You are trying to convince, not a court, not a bunch of lawyers, not a bunch of laymen, but somebody else you've gone to journal club with about some research you've been doing as to the, the proper way of developing your own particular area of expertise. Now, that involves, I think, a number of propositions. Structure and flow, as I have said, are fundamental. It needs to be logical, it needs to be linear, and frankly, if you're dealing with most things, even things as arcane, um, for example, as status epilepticus or something of that kind, you need to have a strong chronological base. I mean, the old joke is most of us are born young and die old. But the, the, the way to read a report, the way to present a report is a chronological way rather than jumping all around from point to point, which regrettably you yeah. see all too often in reports. The second fundamental is you need to be accurate and know the facts. If there are any doubts in your mind, go back to that conference, 
have another conference before you put pen to paper make sure you've got the fact right because people will attack you not for your expert medical conclusions but if you get the facts wrong if you get the dates wrong if you get the order of events wrong if you get the age of the if you get the issue that arises in um, a birth canal cerebral palsy case wrong during um, the the minutes of delivery when um, fetal um, scalp were attached when the internal examinations were done the order when the midwife was there whether there was other people those things are going to be fundamental so you've got to have the factual matrix correct that's just absolutely fundamental the third thing is perhaps more difficult um, it depends on the nature of the case some things are much easier for lay people to understand and you've got to bear in mind that even lawyers who think they know something about medicine are not lawyers are not doctors they're laymen and judges vary enormously and if you happen to be in a case where there's a jury you can have no expectation of understanding unless you make things as simple as possible so you need where possible to use lay language you need where possible um, to explain don't be afraid of explaining there are a lot of people who you may be terribly comfortable in talking about spinal canal stenosis but i had an experienced judge of appeal say to me in the course of a, an argument in an appeal mr glisson what is stenosis now i mean it's not even an unusual word in the language generally i'd have thought but people don't understand so here's another thing if you need to if you're dealing with something that is complex if you're dealing for example with a neurological case then don't be afraid as part of your report or as the introduction to your report and it won't be taken as being belittling or humiliating to put in a glossary people will be assisted to know what they're looking at that's again getting the message across so that your expertise is recognized and understood all of this is designed to do two things one make your opinion clear and two protect you when you get into the witness box from being unfairly attacked or unreasonably attacked for lack of clarity so that's an important factor fourthly and this is the most important thing of all when you're writing a report don't assume anyone knows anything there'll be an awful lot of people who think they know things lawyers read everyone has access these days to things that used to be confined to your profession pretty much everybody can access medline most people know the cochrane collaboration a lot of medical reports attach articles explaining what's said in the reports back in the early days and i'm talking 25 or 30 years ago i did an early lap collie that went really bad um surgeon inadvertently uh inserted the first 10 mil trocar sub umbilically a little bit off course and managed to divide the um, common iliac artery and vein and got a retroperitoneal bleed out they were able to in they put the rest of the trocars in and had full insufflation and no one realized anything was wrong until two things happened the patient's end tidal co2 dropped to alarming levels and blood came out of the first trocar <laughs> because anyway um the patient died on the table for 12 minutes and was resuscitated with brain damage led to a massive case um which went for a very long time that involved because it was the early days of laparoscopic surgery that involved quite a lot of um, very intense discussion about some anatomical things whether there's a reliable bifurcation 
of the common iliac vein and artery um, at or around the umbilicus that whether or not um, it was reasonable uh, for the trocar, if slightly off course, to have penetrated in the way it did. And the nature and degree of the resuscitation by the vascular surgeon and the intensivist. So it was um, it was an interesting and complex case that involved the doc, the surgeon, the hospital, and uh, had some interesting hi history. But that involved intense preparation by the lawyers to understand what the hell was being talked about in the first instance. You can't assume because you know that the audience that you're dealing with knows. So as I say, don't assume that anyone knows anything. They will have read, but it doesn't mean they will have understood. It may need to be carefully and clearly explained. So now we've got to the end of the first two parts of this. We've worked out our position. We've written our report. And now we go to court. This is the easy bit. This is the easy bit. And generally speaking, with some exceptions, depending on the level of conceit or confidence that the medical practitioner in the witness box has, um, it's a res relatively painless one. First, there are three rules. They are really simple. You would never make a mistake if you treated this as a finals viva for your membership or your fellowship, you would approach it differently and perhaps more sensibly. Answer the question. The first, that involves two things. That involves listening to and understanding the question. The question might be stupid, but it doesn't matter. It's the question and answer it. The second thing is, having answered it stop don't volunteer anything because if somebody doesn't understand the answer or wants to challenge it they'll ask you another question but you present a cross examiner in particular with a fertile field to explore if in answer to a question was the car red not a medical question, you might think, but it's a good example. Was the car red? The answer, instead of being no, is no, as a matter of fact, it was a yellow Ferrari. And I think it was traveling at about 75 miles an hour or kilometers an hour in a generally westerly direction along the Princess Highway. Well, that's all well and good. But if you'd stopped at no, the cross-examiner wouldn't have all that other material to add to the next set of questions. So that overall, more information is not good. If people want more information, make them ask you for it. Sometimes people will ask you for it. They'll ask you generally for an opinion. In that case, give them the opinion. But again, be sensible, be careful, be thoughtful. It's a specific opinion about a specific matter. It's not a general dissertation on the development of some particular area of medicine. I had, uh, I mentioned status epilepticus before, but I had a case where a hospital inadvertently um, trying to treat a 20 or 22 year old girl for a very difficult um, epileptic um, problem, brought her in uh, and deliberately induced status epilepticus, but then left her with it for about 48 hours, which wasn't terribly clever. And um, that led to some interesting evidence um, from various neurologists from all over the place, including England and Hong Kong. But more particularly, uh, it led to three or four days being taken up explaining to a particularly dense judicial officer um, what the components of understanding an EEG were. Not, um, not an easy thing to do, but it was, um, it was three or four days I'll never get back. Um, but still, the difference was that counsel on both sides 
um, had a reasonable amount of experience. And we had had probably the best part of a week with the experts going through the EEGs and being taught the basics and, and understanding some of the material in it. I, obviously, this isn't a place to rehearse any of that. But trying to explain that to a judge in the witness box was mind-numbing. And so keeping it tight is the second thing. So answer the question, don't volunteer, keep it tight. The third is probably the hardest of all, suffering fools, because you'll have people who have no idea what they're doing asking you questions. You will have people who have absolutely no idea what they're doing listening to the answers and, to, and being the person who decides the case. And you have to keep yourself polite because becoming agitated, aggressive, or hostile just won't help for two reasons. One is you want your opinion clear on the transcript, and that can only be done if you keep a cool head. Secondly, you want to maintain and retain the reputation which you have for excellence and ability, and that's not going to be done if you become aggressive or combative. Although there's a wonderful story that I stuck on my phone that you may bore you all, but you've got to bear with me with this if I can find it now, um, which came out of an American um, journal. It was about an autopsy and the doctor was asked um, in the first day how many autopsies he'd done on dead people. And he answered all of his autopsies had been on dead people, which I thought was probably quite reasonable. But the next day, by the, the lawyer had done some preparation, and he said, uh, before you perform the autopsy, did you check for a pulse? No. Did you check blood pressure? No. Did you check for breathing? No. So it's possible the patient was alive when you began the autopsy? No. How can you be so sure? His brain was sitting on my desk in a jar, but I suppose it's possible he could have been out practicing law somewhere. Now, I thought you'd like that. And I can see I've got at least a happy response from most people. But don't be combative. Don't be dismissive. It's about management, management of your time, management of the case, management of the outcome and making sure your report's understood. And that pretty much brings me to the end of what I've got to say in my half hour or so. Michelle. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Glisson. Uh, I, I think I speak for everybody when saying that that was actually a masterclass in half an hour. I, I know a number of the people here watching with us are indeed very, very senior and experienced. And so do I. That's one of the issues. Um, but but I, I believe that with to, to a man, they will all be very, very grateful for this timely refresher and update and excellent presentation. Thank you so much, sir. People, would anyone like to ask a question? And if you do, um, you can unmute yourself to do that or you can put it into the chat. Oh, sometimes when no questions come, it's no, because... Paul has, a, Paul has a question, but he just yeah. hasn't unmuted. Paul, let me unmute him. Oh, oh, good. Oh, no. Yes, look, I, thanks for that. That was very interesting. Tell me, do lawyers like long reports or short <laughs> reports? Because well, I've seen, you know, you get somebody else's opinion. It could be 16 pages. And I usually don't do a report that's more than about two or three pages. I did one recently that was six pages, and that was... For me, that was just enormous. Look, it, what, what, what it does a lawyer very, like to see? Sorry, it depends very much on the, on the case, but we like to see conciseness. We like to see clarity. We like to see it as brief as is possible because that makes it easier to get the message across the footlights. But there are some cases which are complex. Mm. And so sometimes you can't avoid the complexity. But I think it goes back to what I said 
initially that you need that structure and flow. If you can get the structure and flow, um, it depends too on the specialty. If you've got, um, I don't know, um, something weird like um, I had a registrar once who managed to sever a popliteal nerve um, doing a, I can't remember what he was doing now, but it, probably varicose vein surgery or well, something. Well, it was something, like yeah, and, I, and it was it was something that was really very straightforward. And I mean, my popliteal nerve's not exactly invisible. It's about as thick as my thumb. But I mean, it was, well, you know, it's a solid um, nerve running down the, anyway. But the point was um, that can be done in a very confined report. It can be done in a couple of pages. This is what was to be done. This is how it was to be done. This was what happened. And this was the error. But if you've got something like that epilepsy case I was talking about, which was very complicated and, and extended over a very long period of time, there were a couple of thousand pages of, um, of her medical history because this girl had had epilepsy since she was six or seven. This happened when she was in her mid-20s. So that in those circumstances, then you have to have a long report. It, it's very much tailored to the case, but as brief as possible to get your message across clearly from your point of view is the answer to the question. Lovely. Um, James, uh, Jacqueline Scott, occupational therapist, has written here in her, in her specialty, she's required to comment on the impact of an injury on various aspects of somebody's life. This mm, includes the impact on relationships, mental health, ability to participate in hobbies, general uh, employment, etc. How do we go about doing that without appearing to be subjective or emotionally involved when doing plaintiff work? Uh, I think the answer to that is almost self-explanatory. It's don't get emotionally involved and write objectively about what you are observing. We're not interested in your subjective opinion about whether this poor girl's weeping every day. We want to know whether she can climb stairs, whether she can wash, whether she can cook, uh, if she's unable to enjoy sex as a consequence of what's happened. We need to know that, all of those things. But they're reportable. They can be done objectively. It, leave it to the lawyers to introduce the emotion. We're good at that. Um, and and leave it to the judge when writing the judgment to say how tragic it all is. Can I throw in this terrible joke? There was a Cly old Clive Everett who was born in 1900 and so has been dead these many years, but um, appeared for a girl who'd lost an arm and a leg in a tragic train accident. And he in those days they were done by juries. And he opened the case to the jury by saying, oh, ladies and gentlemen, this poor young girl, she'll, you know, she'll never be able to be married. She'll never have a normal life. And the judge said, well, no, Mr. Everett, Mr. Everett, you can't say that. You can't say that. He said to him, well, would your honour marry her? And he said, oh, no, no, no. See, ladies and gentlemen, even his honour wouldn't marry her. So. Touche. Yeah, well, so keeping emotion out of it is a good idea. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, uh, uh, Donald. Uh, I apologise for coming in a bit late, so you may have answered my question. I, but in making out a report, is it uh, advisable to put in um, medical uh, literature to, uh, that uh, bears on the case with possible uh, hyperlinks so that lawyers uh, can, in fact, follow it up or not bother with that? putting in such uh, information? I, I, I pointed out that most lawyers now have access to Cochrane and those other collaborations, and so they can do their own research and do, and some even use Wikipedia. But um, realistically, it depends on the case. I'm sorry, I don't know what your special... I'm a gastroenterologist. Yeah, um, okay. Depending, again, it's going to depend very much on the case, but... If you did, I would be very selective. One of the most unhelpful things you can get is a report uh, which annexes a CV, 70 pages of every, every publication I have ever made in any journal, however unreasonable or irrelevant um, in the history of the world, and every article that's ever been written by anybody that I could find in every journal um, that supports my position. Generally, the consequence of that 
is that people tend to look at it and go, there's something fishy here. This bloke's a bit sus. So um, my, my response is a careful, narrow selection of something that is absolutely apposite, yes, generally keep it short. Thanks. Well, there we are. Have I bored you all? <laughs> No, no, not at all. Again, thank you so much for being an engaging speaker and for giving very generously of your time. Um, thank you, everybody, for making your time to listen and to join us on this MAG seminar. I look forward to seeing hopefully many of you on the next. And those of you specialists listening, if you haven't done a seminar and would like to do one, please give me an email or a call and let's see what we can do. And let me just throw this in, if I may, Michelle. Um, yeah. If anybody wants to get back to me, you can get to me through Michelle if you want to talk about anything specific, because I'm perfectly happy to do that. I'm Lawyers like to have clearly defined disputes and it's nice to have reports from both sides that make clear what the ambit of that dispute is. So the better the report, whether from our side or the other side, the, the happier we all are and I'm happy to talk to anybody, um, as I said, about these matters because I think they're important. Wonderful. Absolutely. And, and happy to facilitate that for any of you. Um, if you don't know my email, it's michelle.c at medicolegalassessmentsgroup.com.au. Um, but most of you do because I hear from you a lot. Um, oh, Celine, what have you, you've got a question there. Um, Celine, I'll, I'll get back to you separately. Uh, mm. One sec. All right, everybody. Well, go and enjoy the rest of your day. As I say to my team every every morning, go forth, kick ass, make money. And um, we shall see you all again. And once again, thank you so much, Mr. Glisson. That's all right. I'm just thank about you, to get Michelle. Just to... yeah. Thank you. Terrific. Bye. Stop recording. Thank you.